Discord. All right, well, here we are, and we're continuing the um, Music Technology Guest Lecture Series uh, at Georgia Southern in the year 2021 now, and our first, our, our first inaugural, inaugural guest is Aaron Anderson, who is a tool maker and music technologist presently quarantined in Goleta, California. Uh, Aaron earned his Bachelor of Music in Music Composition and Music Technology from Ball State University and a Master of Music in Music Technology from Georgia Southern University. After a few years as HCI Electronics Designer at the Institute for Digital Media Art, a 2,500-mile bicycle trek, and a couple of years spent pursuing a PhD, uh, Aaron currently works as a freelance audio programmer creating the sound engine for a digital audio workstation. And so we are thrilled to have Aaron back visiting with us again. It's quite an honor. Um, he's come a long way. Uh, he continues to do amazing things. And today he will speak to us a little bit about his uh, pursuit of the last few years um, called Pedal, a C++ audio library meant for people like you and I. So with that, I will turn it over to Aaron Anderson. Again, uh, we will do this with muting of the microphones. If you have questions, throw them in the chat, and Aaron will choose to field them or not, depending on his mood. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, it's all yours. So I have a habit of um, forgetting to look at the chat. So if you want to shout any questions out at me as, as they come, uh, that'd be great. But um, yeah, so uh, it's great to be back, uh, back virtually. Uh, I graduated Georgia Southern um, 20, 2016. Uh, so it's been about five years. And uh, Dr. Thompson asked me to come back and uh, see if, if I had anything to present. And I wanted to take this opportunity to present a C++ audio library. Bill. I started this library in 2018 officially, but it, it really is the second iteration of an original library built called OFX ATK. And uh, as I was preparing the presentation, I was trying to think of um, realizing it had been five years, things I, I, I wanted, I wish I had considered earlier, and uh, things I, I wish I had felt free to try. And um, Pedal is something I wish ha had existed I know, about, about six years ago in my, in my process. Um, and the reason is uh, learning how to program audio in C++ is tremendously difficult. Um, and for a number of reasons that we'll look at, and, um, we'll actually look at it and see what, what causes these difficulties. Uh, but there was no library um, that you could go to. If I want to learn how to build a sine wave oscillator, um, there's plenty of textbooks. You, you can kind of find that answer. Um, it gets. It, a little harder when you want to learn how to build, say, a Moog ladder filter. Um, you'll find 30 or 40 research papers on different techniques to build a Moog ladder filter, and they're, you know, math heavy or computer science heavy, and they're, they're really hard to decipher. And um, just a basic textbook example is would be really helpful to see how to approach something. So um, Pedal is, in, in one sense, a buffet of textbook examples of how to build something. Um, it has a sine wave oscillator that you can use. Uh, but also you can look at the code that built that sine wave oscillator and that code was written in a way to be as accessible as possible without removing complexities that make it good. Um, so Pedal tries to lower the barrier to entry to, by revealing only the, um, the technical things needed at the time, but not by rewrapping or representing those complexities um, in some way. Um, so for clarity, uh, it depends on your experience or if you have any experience with C++. Um, but a lot of the clarity issues aren't that C++ is difficult. It's that the, um, the classes were named wrong or that things were so flexible that they became so abstract that they became nearly impossible to decipher. And that's what of often happens in, in JUICE. Um, Betel is... is Modularity comes from both approaches. Uh, it comes from clarity because I don't use what's in C++ called base classes. There's no hidden functions. What's on the page is what is happening. And you don't need to be an expert in C++ just to read the code. Um, 
And regarding performance, uh, this hasn't been extensively tested yet, but um, it is a usual wrong impression that co complex code is really performative. And the more complex it is, the more performative it is. And uh, sometimes that is true, but uh, often programmers get the, get the wrong idea that if you do something a harder way, it's going to be better. And that's usually not, C++ is actually designed to be the opposite of that. Um, it's built on this idea of zero cost abstraction. So if you abstract an idea, you know, make something easier, um, it doesn't cost any computation time. It doesn't make your application slower to make um, code easier to read and write. Oof. Yeah, so um, I, I realized the need, um, actually during my time at Georgia Southern, I was building what was called Dipole Particle Generator. It was a pretty massive max batch. It's, I'm definitely not gonna, going to build a bigger one ever. I don't, I don't see the need. But um, I ran into a lot of brick walls that I, I couldn't really come over in uh, max. First of all, the, um, the efficiency, it was pretty pretty bad. I could get 60 to 70 grains simultaneous or something like that, but likely I could do a thousand if I had written it in C. So that's that's one limitation of Max, even if you write if you use Max well. Um, another issue I, I had was that Max MSP handles audio and buffers. And for a lot of reasons, you need to handle your audio data per sample. And uh, pedal is inherently per sample. And every audio class you use, you can you can use per sample logic, um, which tends not to surprisingly not to be more difficult, but uh, it does give you more flexibility. Okay, so that's kind of the origin story. Um, I was living with uh, a fellow colleague, Key, uh, who works at Apple now. He's the second engineer on this project. Um, the the current working relationship is uh, I, I ask him if my decisions are stupid and he tells me if they are or, or I believe him because he's exceptional. And he, he joined, uh, he's one of the reasons I started um, officially on this effort. Um, so if you had to compare a pedal to something, uh, right now I've been, I've been comparing it to processing. Um, that comparison is most useful uh, for my, where the target audience is. I want pedal to be the audio community, what processing is to the visual community. Um, and that is to say, I, I don't necessarily care or want um, if people who use pedal to invent or make the, the, you know, the most amazing software ever. I, I hope it just is a barrier to entry and an environment to explore and uh, create accessibility in this field. Okay, so. Aaron? Aaron? Yes. Um, do you see Pedal as a relate uh, replacement or like a link to Juice, or do you think it could go both ways? As a, it's definitely not a replacement. Um, okay. Juice uh, is ninety percent um, a framework, and uh, Pedal I would call a library. Um, that being said, the Juice namespace DSP is essentially a different form of what Pedal is. Um, it's, a, it's a lot different, but it, it's kind of the same scope. Um, you'll see that your pedal itself, sorry. Well, okay. do you just feed it the, the audio buffer and then pedal takes over and you can code everything else in pedal essentially? We'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so to compare it to juice, um, a juice is an audio application framework, um, primarily, and it's a little thing because it, Juice kind of gets thrown in with Max MSP, and in, in a way, it's kind of like that. It gets thrown in with Super Collider, um, but really, what Juice offers mostly is a way to build efficient, large-scale, professional applications. And they built their application framework with the idea in mind that people will be using audio. And so, there's things that even other application frameworks have nothing to do to, with audio. There's things Juice has that um, handles things differently because they know it's an audio application. Um, for example, the juice value tree identifier comparisons are almost single cycle. Um, so if you have a data oriented design, um, that's great. But <laughs> that's the problem with juice. It is, most of the complexities are, um, I, I wouldn't walk 
having the experience I had, I wouldn't walk into Juice again without two years experience of C++, just from my own sake, whatever that means. It means who knows for anyone else. But uh, Juice assumes you know C++ very deeply. Um, and they try to communicate a lot of ideas through the way they express C++ ideas. And that information is, when I first learned Juice, I, they were trying to tell me all this information that was totally lost on me because I didn't know C++ well enough. Um, but yeah, so um, Juice is more of a framework. Until, re until they added the DSP library, I would have been comfortable saying it is own framework. Um, you need to bring audio libraries in or make your own. Um, so to that end, I'm going to look a little bit at what pedal is. I'm going to hide all that for now. <laughs> Okay, so as I said, it's a C++ audio library, so you expect to see your files and code. Um, it, I worry about the build system, but that's not quite the topic of today. Uh, uh, this is a collection of the source files, the CPP files for all the library. And this is just giving you a, should give you a sense of what, what is available to use. Um, I have like linear envelopes, curved envelopes, oscillators. Um, I'm adding various types. Uh, uh, one distinction from the way Max MSP handles this is I'm naming the oscillator based on their method. Uh, so if it's a trivially calculated sign, you know, if you're just calling the sign function, it's called trivial sign. If it's a wavetable sign, it's, it's called that. And that's how I'm trying to follow a consistent convention with that. And I have uh, some things you might expect in an audio library, uh, compressor, gates, uh, spectral, um, I think this is called, yeah, PFFT and max MSP um, is equivalent to STFT and uh, pedal. And this is FT is for time for a transform, I believe, uh, is usually how this is referred to in, in the audio field. Yeah, a few buffer mechanisms to you know load sound files, play sound files, and this is all the behind the scenes of pedal. So if we look at just a simple example, um, let's start with simple sign. I think should be safe. I have lost the ability to get this back over here. Okay. Okay, so. Here's some uh, application detail. But, um, I'm going to go quickly through this right now just to show um, what how pedal is used uh, on, in a basic sense. And then we can go through and actually do some of these things. Uh, so you can include an object if you want to use it here. Um, T and I made the decision that every object you need uh, has a separate include file, and we did that for a few reasons. Um, it's actually kind of bad practice to include all of them just because of your build time. And uh, we, if I'm including 100 examples, the build time would get really slow. So that's one of the reasons we decided to. But also, that gives you a direct way, an easy path to find how this works. Um, if I want, an, I guess I'll, I'll hold off on doing that at the moment, though. Um, this can be kind of safely ignored for now, but we'll get back to it. So if you wanted an oscillator using pedal, you just call your trivial sign and make an object from that. And that's done. By default, it's set to um, 440 hertz. And um, then we will, we don't need to, since there's no pointer, we don't need to do anything in the main loop. And then we just call generate sample for every sample of audio we require from that oscillator. Um, so, you can easily swap things out if you're um, if you use your keyboard uh, like this, trivial saw, and uh, oscillators that way. You can call this sign off or saw oscillator. If you the name doesn't matter, but you would want that to be consistent. And I'm going to set the initial frequency to 100 hertz, so it's not aliasing too badly, and we can actually as long as I'm still building that, just run and make sure that is a stall now. I'll explain some of, I'm moving to a terminal now, but um, I think best to ignore it. 
Uh, so I built all the examples and that was a simple sign, I believe it was. So if I run examples, simple sign, oops. oh, it didn't build. Okay, well, I'll just run test run and then we'll go back to that instead of wasting time going back. <laughs> Here's a weird example. <laughs> so I just ran the first example I could get a hold of. Um, I needed to change the build system to run my new document, but we're going to be going back to that in just a little bit. Um, yeah, so this build system, uh, the, me going back and forth through to this terminal is not a necessary part of Petal. Uh, this just happens to be what I do. Um, I intend in the future, it's not ready at the moment to have something uh, distributable with Petal that allow, contains the Visual Studio Code script to make this play button work. That's the long story. So it, it's not there yet, but um, part of the, um, the the dev plan is to to handle that so people don't have to run into the terminal uh you know and learn how to use cmake make or whatever the tools they're using or you know even have to fuss with the terminal at all um right um if you don't mind i'm going to take a five minute break while i get some water and run out <laughs> you got it oh um so go ahead and we'll discuss there's some there's some question about why Let's see. Is, so the audio callback uh, method belongs to pedal, correct? The, yeah, uh, the example builds. Uh, but we're we're going to go through through that in finer detail okay. about what's ignorable and what's not. Yeah. All uh, right. Because this is a little weird. Um. So, but notice that this is an input to this, which is a weird thing. Um. We're treating that function as an object. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, five minute break. I will pause the recording right, if I can. Um, so hold on, hold on to those. Um, okay. But um, I'm gonna make sure I don't miss a couple of points I wanted to make before before doing that. Because I, I was I was thinking about whether or not it's it's worth everyone's while to um, to see what you know where where all our audio work lands. And I think I think. The case is that it is worth it, even if you're not a developer, um, if you're a producer, or if you're in a, in a, using a DAW, it, the software you use always comes back uh, to this audio callback function. Um, and I, I can't think of an instance in real runtime audio programming where, where this isn't true. Um, so this kind of is the universality of all of what we do and understanding that kind of, in some ways explains why, you, you know, your DAW can't have 400 tracks um, and why that it might be difficult to do that. Um, yes, decided um, um, one of the reasons I, I built Pedal was because I, I felt like a phony audio programmer because I, I didn't actually know how to build an application, you know, and I'm, I, if I'm a programmer and I can't program an application, I, I don't, on my own, you know, uh, I, I probably shouldn't call myself a programmer, which is, uh, and, and in retrospect, don't do not do any gatekeeping. That's not a good perspective to have. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I decided to get to the bottom of it. I expected it to be a longer and more terrifying journey, like how, how a CPP file is turned into something that you can double click and it runs in magic. Um, the reality is it's, it's not too bad. It, it gets bad when things get flexible. So as long as we keep things fairly inflexible, um, it can be a little bit more palatable. But uh, as we go through this, though, it's if if you don't intend to ever program CPP I, I, or program C++ or become a developer or to pursue that, I, I think it's worthwhile to see. Or even if you're doing it in a different language, um, this provides information um, for maximum speed people. Um, because when you put all these objects together, ultimately all these objects get comes into one single audio callback at the very end, and that's how you hear it, um, more or less. Uh, okay, so I, 
as I said before, I, I intend to have a build system similar to processing and open or accessible to get into. But for now, the way we'll just build a new piece of software is to create a new file. Uh, let's call this um, Friday. Um, okay, so this is uh, the .cpp is nothing special, nothing magic happens um, by adding that. It's just a, an extension. You can add that to any file and it hopefully is true. Um, to make an application in C++, there's one thing you can't go without. This will always be there. Um, there's no C++ application without um, one of these. Uh, for some reason, and a lot of things make them hidden. I'm not quite sure why, there's probably a decent reason, but juice hides their main function, what's called a macro. So it's text that will write itself at compile time and open frameworks, not really hides, but move their function to another document. But no matter what, this is how it starts. Um, and uh, normally you could actually open terminal like this. You would open your compiler as an application and feed it that text document and then you would tell it to output an executable and that would work um, for the sake of brevity. And um, this not being about that, we are going to use the uh, small build system I have that was built exclusively for examples in Pedal. Um, this build system is two pages and relatively a few lines, 700 lines, and it just builds a window, um, uh, audio stream, MIDI stream, keyboard callback, just a few of the basic things and as simple as approach as possible. Uh, so we'll add it to this. So we have our application called friday.cpp. This list I'm accessing, don't, don't worry about the details here, but uh, this will be called my build system when I build this. So there's an, a list of examples that need to be compiled. I'm just going to add Friday to that. And it just looks for the, it doesn't care about the extension. So this is why your simple sign example didn't compile. Right, because I had not done that. Yeah, or I actually I had and I had deleted it because it was a bad example. <laughs> but yeah, um, so now if I compile pedal, you'll see some new messages. It's only going to recompile the new stuff. Um, so you see it just ran through this as usual, but we have some new information. And so Freebug exists. If I run the program by going to my example folder, Oops. do Friday debug. It looks like it might have failed, but it actually didn't. It, it ran Friday debug and it successfully ran that. It, su it successfully did nothing. Um, where is, here we are. Okay, so not a very useful application, but this is a very basic, you know, if, if that were on your desktop on a Mac, you could double click it and nothing would happen successfully. And that, that's something. Um, the usual first, oops, first thing to do is hello world. I'm going to do it wrong quickly first. and just look at the error. So it's complaining oh, really quickly. Uh, this is how C++ handles outputting. This text is pushed to that, and then an inline is pushed afterwards. Um, it's a little unfortunate. This, these characters um, don't really make much of an appearance, and they kind of invented an extra character for no reason, um, in my view. <laughs> uh, and they are used a few times elsewhere. But um, you can ignore what they're called or how they're pronounced. And, it's, it's safe to just do that like this always. But you noticed we had an error. And um, it, fortunately, it, it's actually very helpful for this error. You can't use, you can't use C out without including the library that, that contains that data. Which happens to be an IO stream, but we got that information from the output. So if we add IO stream, this is all very happy. And if we try to, again to compile that, it does it successfully. And if we run it, we should get hello world. All right. 
so that's the, that's the classic example. Um, another thing you'll see, I just wanted to address is something like this. If you do that, you no longer need these. And now this code is valid. Um, my personal opinion, I've, I've never used that line. Um, if I'm using the standard library, uh, I think it's helpful to have std colon colon there. That way I know that's a standard library function. I don't have to kind of guess. So I, I really don't love this, but I do use it for pedal because I think, um, you know, otherwise people would have to say, if you want a buffer, pedal buffer, if you want a window, pedal window. And that gets a little bit tedious, even if you're copying and pasting stuff. So this is the, um, this is the correct, or quote unquote, correct way to use this in your implementation. Um, but everything belongs to a namespace called pedal. And a, a namespace is named appropriately, is literally just a space for names. And the reason it exists is because you might name something and another library you use named something else, the same thing, and then you have an error because it doesn't know which one you're referring to. If you wrap it in a namespace, there's no risk of that happening. So pedal is wrapped with pedal as a namespace. And if you use a library, you use pedal in front of it. Um, yeah, so there we are. I'm going to get rid of this and get rid of this. The hello world is gone. And the next step is kind of the reason, uh, one of the reasons programming C++ audio is so hard. Is uh, I, mean, I think the next step would be to make the application stay open until we tell it to close. But even that can be kind of tricky. And I'm going to close it with the close of a window. So we're going to skip that step. Um, so we're going to jump straight into defining an audio function and having that audio function called and run constantly until the application is over. So if I include example app source, example app, this is um, what allows me, what gives me a window, uh, gives me RT audio, gives me RT MIDI, um, this source code here. And if you'd like to take a look, the header is it's not too long, but it's, it's a little bit aggressive C++ in some places. Um, like 57 lines in the header. Oh, oh, here we are. And what was that? 500 lines in the CPP. But for our, our audio, what we're actually doing is just including RT audio. <laughs> so are there so other options besides RT audio? There's two primary options. Um, actually, I can't even think of one. Um, so RT audio is the C++ way of handling that, um, getting sound to and from your sound card. Uh, port, port sound or port audio? Port audio, I think. Uh, I can't, port audio. Uh, the one I think Maximus P uses is, um, it's just basically the same thing, but a C library. Um, and you can use both in any context. You can usually, or right, you can use, um, I, you can use poor audio with a C library for C++. There's nothing preventing that. Um, but I, I had one that was easy to integrate just because of C++. But yeah, I think it's, it's just those two. And my recent understanding that poor audio is a little bit nastier to deal with, but better. And uh, updated RT audio, I think was made at McGill or Stanford and hasn't been touched in like 15 years. So uh, it's kind of, it's, a, it's really a hard choice, um, but you can, I think Juice includes both. Um, but yeah, that seems to be it. And uh, I'm just going to just highlight a couple things, but by no means uh, is this all meant to be understood right now. Um, when we create an app, we just take an object from RT Audio so we create an RT audio object. This deals with all of our audio stuff. So that belongs to our app. And then we make an example audio callback. Um, so this is how we define our audio callback in beforehand. Um, 
I need to change the name of that. But if we go back to the header, this is the actual audio callback function. And this text just replaces this. So this is um, the, the reason this looks so ugly. I, I don't quite understand the initial reason, but it's, it's a function pointer. That's all it is. This is a way to treat a function, an object. Um, you can pass it around, do things with it, assign it, um, give it to things, which is not something you're shown ever, if at all, or often, if at all, in, in C++, um, passing functions around as objects. That's something that's very common to do in C. Um, but yeah, at any rate, so like you said before, when we were defining that audio callback, we were actually re redefining this. We're assigning, we're giving, we're assigning that callback to this data member. So when we define it in that CPP, uh, we're, we're calling callback equals whatever we passed in. And now that function that we made there is given to RT audio, which is a lot, I'm, I know. <laughs> um, so, and I've also, I've dressed up the audio callback a little bit. RT audio has all of this stuff. Um, and that's ugly and not, not quite manageable. And I, I just call uh, this custom audio callback, which deals with some of these things. Um, trying to think, but that's just a convenience. You could use this if you were building, you know, just the minimal. You could use this directly. You could pass audio in here. Um, I'm just instead of doing that, making a more friendly looking function and calling that instead. Uh, but this gets called. Um, without my consent, the, the, we set the, the sample rate and the buffer size, and it, it handles it on its own. If we scroll into when an app is made, um, this is that function. We had to name this so that we could tell it what to expect. Uh, we could put just a raw function pointer here. But as long as the function match, matches what we define, then we're, we're safe there. And I, you see here is where I just assigned that. That's all that happens. So we're just basically giving RT audio the one function it needs to do its job. And it's our job to make sure that works. Um, so this is just a little bit of what the back end looks like. This is some of the, the setup uh, for RT audio. Um, but yeah, we should, we should get out of here because this is nasty. But we can use that without having to deal, deal with that. So in this example space, I, I made app a namespace. So anytime you write app and do two full colons, you get a list of all the functions you can do or get, uh, to an app application. So there's not too many, but this is the full application framework. And we just actually want to get the data member title example app. And forgive me for this, but I think I'm going to leave it like that. But we, we are going to make it like a pointer or make it as a pointer. Um, we maybe talk about why at the end, if, if that's important. And then if we call initialize example app, we can pass it our not yet defined uh, audio callback. And uh, this will, we need to name, there we go. So this will create a pointer uh, to our app and allocate memory. Um, so that's why pointers are dangerous. Um, yeah. It, it is also, I am just feel important to note that it's a, possible to build this differently without a pointer and it will clean up itself automatically. But we don't need to worry about that now. Um, so if we initialize the app, I made it impossible to initialize without passing it an audio callback function. So we should define one. And uh, it's still not going to be happy. Um, this is actually checking the type. You see it says argument type void pointer parentheses is incompatible. Um, it, it recognizes that our function doesn't have the right um, inputs. Uh, so we can check this function. I'm going to sneak up here and just still, oops. going to steal the function here and get the inputs from this instead of trying to remember them um, because I know it's looking for that. Uh, 
and it doesn't like that because I need to put the namespace in front of it, like I did here. So this should be a, a legitimate application now. Uh, when I when I start the app, it's going to get the audio callback. Um, one thing we have not done, uh, this generates a lot of memory. It fills up your RAM. If, if you just ran this application, that RAM would never be freed. And that's why this little symbol is dangerous. It, it implies a responsibility. Um, so to take care of that before testing it, we should do, uh, let's see, free memory? Yes, free memory. OK, so we, we took a bit of a shortcut um, implementing RT audio by using the, um, the, two, the two document example header. Um, but this is basically it. Um, this function will be called by the, the, you know, the real function that gets called by the library. All right, so let's run that or compile that. It compiled successfully and we can run. All right. So it started and stopped an audio stream. Um, so there is nothing we've done yet to make the application run forever. Um, and I don't know if you saw for a brief second, it actually opened a window. But if we um, create a while loop, well, app should continue. This. Oh, and also the, all these functions take app. All right, so now if this works, we should get a window with um, consistent silence. And we do. So that's great. So that's what the, um, the app pointer does. It, it handles some of that for you. It doesn't do it in a way that's um, very handholdy. Uh, the, the system I'm building is, this was just kind of a, a fast system that needs to compile fast because we may have 100 examples in this at some point, and those all need to be compiled. And the compile time actually you know, spirals up if you're not careful about these things. So that's actually why the pointer is there. And um, we can talk about that a little later. But first, uh, since we've come this far, let's get some audio. All right, so now we're actually getting around to um, pedal. One thing um, we should include example when we use pedal, oops, is our settings. This is just a document that gives you a sample rate and buffer size and is consistent with the library's known sample rate and buffer size. And I can override on this, so I can just set the sample rates and buffer size here. So if I do settings, I believe, I've, I've recently changed the name of all of these, so. It's settings. I'm not sure why it's not telling me the answers though. It makes me sad. Ah. I know why. This is a, a learning moment. It's great. <laughs> okay, so it doesn't recognize settings. Uh, but that's part of pedal. Um, and it will tell us names, name followed by must be a class or namespace name. That's not true. This is a static member. So it's actually not giving us the right error, which is a little, little sad. But if we add using namespace pedal, I think that should clear this all up. Yes, great. Um, alternatively, I could have done this. Um, but since I'm going to be using pedal through this whole document, it makes sense to do it this way. Aaron, is there an instance of setting that occurs when you run the application that this is referencing? 
Yeah, yeah. So there was an instance of setting when when um, actually first when settings compiled, it's giving it given a default, and that, that's a little. Yeah, this is a little weird. Um, but to make this available to everyone, this is my solution. I'm just making a. a oh, sorry. I don't. Let me think. Actually, no, there is not an instance. That's correct because um, um, a static have, having a static member means you don't have to have an instance to access this these settings, right? Right. Yeah. So if if a member is static, then you can access anywhere, even without creating an object. Um, and this is a fully this is probably a, a more clever way to do this, but but I, I guess I wanted the setup function, so I put it in a class like this. But uh, yeah, so it's because it's static, I can access it that way. So this actually is another reason. Uh, there's a part of C++ that it's this colon colon business. It's really frustrating, right? Um, if this was right, I mean, that is right. And that's what's frustrating um, because sample rate is a member of settings. Settings is in the namespace of pedal. So these colons don't mean the same thing. And that's just the worst feeling in the world. Um, but I, I haven't found a, a, this is kind of a cheat. Anytime I see two colons, this has never broken for me. Um, I just say belongs to, and that's always accurate. Uh, sample rate belongs to settings. Settings belongs to pedal. And that's always accurate. So if you see the double colon, it, you can just, uh, the second thing belongs to the first thing. And um, that will always be true. And that's a, it seems to be a decent way to think of that. And there's no exceptions. Um, note that that's a double colon. A single colon means something else. And that's part of C++. We don't need to talk about what that means right now. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's certainly frustrating when, when symbols have contextual meaning. And this is one of those cases. And that's why I think it's kind of hard to learn the double colons and what they mean. Um, but yeah, moving moving forward, let's uh, make a sine wave first. That seems to be appropriate. So I'm including uh, pedal trivial saw. Um, I I included uh, the way I included this requires the word pedal just to give you a nice scrollable window that gives you all the options. Um, as you're typing, that works faster for me if, if I have that available. Okay, and then we'll be ver verbose. Okay, so we have a, a sine wave oscillator and we have this function that we've defined this is called every buffer size. This will be called um, for every buffer size of samples as the audio comes up. And we, our responsibility is to fill our output buffer, which here is a pointer to a float, um, up with their amount of samples. Uh, so there's a couple ways to handle that. Um, RT audio, I think by default, I don't know if this can be changed, has interleaved samples. So that means your samples, if they're stereo, will be left, right, left, right, left, right. Um, and that works really nicely with um, per sample objects. And it's among the reasons I chose that. Um, so yeah, and the, the alternate way to just store audio, it's one of two, um, is to store all your left samples in a row and then all your right samples in a row. This is what Juice does, and there's a lot of performance reasons to handle things that way, uh, but there's a lot more freedom in handling things in a per sample basis, which is what we're going to do here. So we have this output buffer called out. We need to visit every cell of that buffer. So sample index equals zero. So whatever we put in here will be called buffer size times. So this will, whatever we put here will likely be called, will be called 512 times because the default buffer size is 512. Make sure you define I as uh, what it is. What is I here? There, there we go. go. Oops. Oh, wow, that was very broken for a second there. There we go. <laughs> All right, yeah, so that's what's happening now. And I, I've named the sample index so it's clear. So for every single sample, um, 
we'll just do it mono first and see. I'm interested to see if uh, I don't silence the second channel, what will happen? I haven't done that. But anyway, we were going to scrub through every single sample and we can say the output buffer array, since it's a pointer to a float, we can put array brackets on it and it will index the whatever element of that pointer. So it's going to count steps from that pointer, but you can do this with, um, you, you can do this on any pointer uh, usually, but uh, it, it will break pretty easily. So we need to stay, um, if, if we try to access an index higher than our buffer size or higher than the space allotted, then we'll get a terrible crash that's really hard to find. Um, so just to, to inform you of the dangers here. Um, so we'll take our sample index. Uh, so that would go zero to 512 equals sign oscillator dot generate sample. And we'll turn it down because things get spicy. All right, and I'm, I'm genuinely curious. We'll, we'll listen. Um, I should have two audio channels going in and I'm only erasing one of them. How did you know your buffer size was 512? I just happen to remember writing the code, um, but it's going to be whatever we set here. Uh, this is how you can know. Um, when you're creating this function, uh, it creates, it has a default values for sample rate and um, buffer size. So yeah, so when I refer to it, I'll probably just say 512 because it, it seems less abstract. Yes. Um, but assume 512 equal buffer size so too, you, in case with, I'm- <laughs> With this method, with the settings, you don't have to like constantly be passing the sample rate and stuff to all your processors. They just know it, right? That's good and bad. Uh, that's, that's actually true in Juice too. Um, it just doesn't seem that way. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the corresponding issue with that is if I change my sampling rate, what's going to happen to all those four objects? <laughs> um, because it, it, the, the value it has is changed, but there's no callback yet to tell it to update. If say, if there's a phase increment, um, there's nothing that says this value changed. So you need to update your phase increment. I'm adding that. And uh, the, the easy way to handle that is the way Juice does, you just inherit a function that says set, you know, prepare to play, I think they call it. I need a prepare to play function on every one of those objects to handle that automatically. Um, what I'm actually, I think, going to do instead, ah, uh, never mind. <laughs> That's a pretty big tangent. Um, so as we create the app, we should have 440 hertz oscillator. Let's see if we do. Not on my end, isn't this coming in late? Good. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so debug time. Oh, <laughs> okay, so not, not too much debug, but um, I've never actually started the audio thread. Um, there's a function that it needs to be called explicitly for the audio thread to start. So that function is start app. Great. <laughs> that went more smoothly than I expected. Right, so um, that's not right. Uh, and I, I wasn't sure if I expected it to, that could be a number of things, but I'm going to go ahead and iterate through all the uh, all the output channels in case that's part of this. Let's see, channel index is a good name. So we'll, the same way, we'll just loop. For every sample, we'll loop through every channel of that sample. So while the channel index is less than num channels out, channel index increment. And then we just add our same function here. And then we need to account for this value. Uh, oh, I was only assigning every other rule because I didn't deal with the interleaving. So that's what the noise was. Um, so sample index times num channels out plus our current index. And if you work out the math, um, this will be, you know, 
just to sign it left, right, left, right, if it's stereo. Um, it, it makes a, a bit more sense if you do it, the steps on their own. But this is, um, once you have a, 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 um, an understanding of how to wrap the channels within that frame and how to put those frames back, there's really only two ways. You only have to learn this thing once. And um, this is just the, um, taking one sample and a, doing applying it to all of the samples within that frame, depending on how many channels. So it's a, a bit terse, it's a nested for loop, but the actual action is just generate sample. Um, and that, we're going to get an error that I just caught, but I'm going to let it happen, I think. There we go. And uh, the error, is, did anyone catch the error actually? Know why that sounds wrong? I'm curious. <laughs> okay, yeah, the, um, that was not 440 Hertz. Um, that was, I'm going to assume 880 Hertz because we're calling generate sample for every frame. So left is getting an up sample, the right sample is getting an updated sample. So if we select this, I think I can do this. I can undo. We're only going to generate a new sample for every sample, not for every um, channel. And then assign that here. So now we'll only generate one next sample for every sample of the buffer. There we go. That sounds more uh, more classic. <laughs> there was a really nice fade out that didn't happen on my end. I think Zoom did that. <laughs> There's no automatic fade out in this application, unfortunately. When you when you close, it's aggressive. Well, that um, was the first time that Zoom made anything any better. <laughs> well, it did distort it a little bit, so I won't give it too much credit. <laughs> um. Okay, so we've made it this far. Um, so that's a little more than uh, what would be expected to, to use pedal examples, but I, I thought it important to show uh, parts of the build system. Um, do we have time to add an envelope? What's the usual time frame? Oh, we're good. Uh, usually the time frame is, you know, an hour presentation up to an hour and a half. We like to leave a little time for questions, but you know, we're at a uh, 55 minutes. So okay, we've cool. got time. Great. So, um, I hope this is at least roughly clear. Um, the audio callback is this legendary thing that exists in, in every audio call application. And it always kind of boils down to that. You have some kind of output that needs generated. Um, you may have a separate audio callback for inputs and outputs, um, but it always, it always just comes back to this. And um, there's not too much, not too much in the way of making the code simpler, short of making it not C++, um, which is also a valid alternative. Uh, I do think Julius's language soul is starting to become more promising and hopefully will win out and be easier than this, but we'll see. Uh, I have a okay. request. Um, sure. So, so we've gotten this far, and I like how remarkably simple it is to just build an application. Like this is all it took. It's not very much. Uh, and the and the audio callback is pretty interesting in that we're able to pass in a function as an argument uh, mm. because it's a function pointer, right? Um, but what we haven't done is uh, for those that aren't totally familiar with C++, we didn't really look at what all a trivial sign can mm. do. And how would we, like, how do we change the amplitude? How do we change the pitch? Oh, yeah. Let's, let's, uh, let's change the frequency next. Um, so uh, another th feature this has, um, it has MGUI. It's not direct accessible but um, you can do things like add slider um, you don't get to decide where it goes or anything like that it's not fancy but you assign it to your application the index is just um, how many sliders have you built so far so zero we'll call this frequency gigahertz as if that were unclear 
and uh, do 100 to 700, sure. And is that initial value slightly out of 2440? Okay, so this function tells the app it, to make a slider. How that works is um, ignorable. But um, how, how would you pass that data to your audio thread? Um, there, I, I will show you the easiest possible control rate. Um, that is just, you know, do it before or after your for loop. And that, that's, uh, in a lot of instances, that's great. Um, Usually it's not the best system in the world, but it's not going to cause problems usually. So if we have our, uh, our oscillator, our sine oscillator, let's just make a new float, make this as easy as possible. New frequency app, get slider. So whenever you want to know the current value of the slider, you just call get slider onto that slider. And they, every function will need an app pointer. And uh, the index was zero. So you just make sure the index is the one you want and you'll get the value out. Um, so here we've gotten the, the frequency value and to, ass to assign the oscillator to that frequency, set frequency, new frequency. Okay, so we wanna know what the new frequency is. We ask the slider what value it has like this. And then on the sine oscillator, we tell it to change the frequency. Hey, there's a slider. <laughs> oh, it did work. I didn't think it was working because of the lag. <laughs> I was just thinking I didn't, I didn't, yeah, <laughs> that's great. Uh, okay, cool. So that's a real basic way. Um, all of my generators have consistently named function. So generate sample, if it's something that's a generator, like an oscillator, like even an LFO, even though it is a controller, it will have a generate sample um, because it, that's its business is generating samples. And something like a filter will have a function called process sample and take as an input the sample to be processed. Um, but yeah, so you can always look for um, these functions. And if if you don't, if you have this class and you want to know what kind of functions does it have, um, you can look at the source code, which we have here. Um, you could look for it. Uh, that's one reason I included this pedal folder. Um, there and they include, you know, include pedal trivial sign. So if you're looking for it, include pedal, it should be somewhat easy. But I think every single text, every single code text editor has this function F12. If I just click on the, what I'm looking for, hit F12, it's going to take me to the source of that. And um, that's not guaranteed to work always, but um, in pedal it does. I, I go out of my way to make sure I'm not doing things that will break systems that look that up for you. Um, but yeah, so this brings us to our HPP, our header file. And this basically tells us what that class can do and what functions it has. Um, so this is just how do we make it which is actually a complicated topic that I'll gloss over. Uh, generate sample is the, the business function. And I have an alternative generate sample function if you want to drive your oscillator by phase. So if you plug a phaser into the first input, you know, no longer need to worry about the frequency. It will be locked to the phase of whatever is in it. Um, and then your usual set get, um, so any variables are private, you can't directly access. Um, but you can get them through set frequency and get frequency. So if you're curious about the frequency of something and you need to use that value, you call get frequency, it returns that value. And these are pretty common. There's always a part of my header with a bunch of set functions and a bunch of get functions. And all my members are private unless I can avo can't avoid them being private, um, which is the rule to follow. Um, uh, yeah. No reason to think harder about it. Just follow the rule and then you don't run into really bad problems. <laughs> I have another question. So here we set the frequency with a slider, uh, which where the timing is generated by user interaction. Um, but oftentimes in C++, what we lack is some sort of musical scheduler 
Um, do you have any solutions to that? I know Pedal is not a musical scheduler um, library, um, but you have this app that you're building. Is there some sort of musical scheduler, or what are some solutions to that? There is no like, there's no abstracted music um, system for that, for scheduling. Um, no um, timeline kind of editor tools. Uh, as far as timing goes, at the moment, it's just envelopes, uh, phasers. I, I use phasers to time. This is, oh, before we leave, we should look at the sequencer example. But that's the closest I have. There's nothing built in um, that will, like, say, start note this time. Um, I am considering expanding my phaser timing implements to be a little more broad and useful that way. But I'm worried about some bringing in some issues like beats per minute and tempo and meter and uh, worried about the implications of what everything else will need um, for it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I do think there's a lot of um, a good good reasons to pursue these sample driven timing mechanisms that um, like um, having a phaser and then a um, edge detector trigger things. And that's how I, I do it here. So I have, you know, um, I thought that's how I thought I was doing it here. Yeah, there we go. We have a phaser, you know, BPM to Hertz. So this like small utility functions like that. And then an edge detector and every 60, you know, at every quarter note, it's going to give me a new edge, but there's no kind of broader system. Um, well, and another thing I was thinking on that note though, is an end segment envelope would be really useful just for like basic, yeah, if you're just scheduling a sound at the very least, um, something I'm adding. I have a linear envelope, ADSR, and multi-mode, attack release, attack decay, um, attack hold, release decay, all, all the modes you'd expect. But uh, a lot of places have end segment envelopes, which could do a lot of timing things. Um, yeah. And uh, I do have a lofty goal of implementing a parameter system in my um, example, my pedal framework. That's a little more broad, broader than our example framework. But, um, but yeah. Um, so the next thing that uh, would, is necessary to do, it's not as obvious with frequency, but if, if you listen to this again, I, I think that quality is clear enough to hear the snare stepping. Anyway, you can kind of hear it's not smoothly going through frequencies. It's only getting an update uh, once every buff. Um, so that sudden frequency change can cause a click and uh, we should avoid that. And Pedal has uh, addressed the issue with uh, an object called smooth value. So this is just a special value that does audio rate smoothing. So if I make a smooth value, um, this is a templated type like uh, vector is. So you need to tell what type of value you have. Um, I'm just going to have a float, so I say float. Um, our making a float frequency is almost equivalent. Um, so I'm going to call this smooth frequency. So this is just um, basically a float with some special features. So instead of, uh, so we have our new frequency, instead of setting our sine oscillator directly, which we don't want to do here, we set our value directly. So this tells our frequency that we'd like to be at the new value, but you can't go there immediately. We're going to slowly approach that value in a, in a smooth and music, musically useful way. Um, so it just tells it what frequency it should be. It needs to get there on its own. So this is, should be called every single sample um, float smooth value equals smooth frequency dot process. And this has a process function, but not a process sample function. So process needs to be called. Um, and just to be even more clear here, This returns the result, but um, the official way to get the results is get current value. 
because um, you may smooth it once per sample, but need to request that sample multiple times. So this breaks this up into two steps. Um, handle the smoother. This is as part of this class. It needs to be called every sample, no matter what. Um, and we get that value and assign it. And then we need to every sample set frequency to the smooth value. Get. Am I naming something wrong? Uh oh. I don't remember. All right. So I have a. Uh, does at does, the moment um, forgot. When you when you process the uh, I forget what it's called now. When you process a smooth value, is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. Does it return a void or does it return a float? It actually does return a float. Um, so, but that's just out of convenience. I would like um, we could just do this. Oops. Oh, smooth frequency, not smooth value. That's why I was having trouble. Sorry. We could just, uh, yeah, we just need to put smooth value here. Sorry, I um, got in the way of myself because I usually don't do it this way. Um, so we've processed our smooth, this must be called once per sample. We get the current value and then we assign the oscillator's frequency to that value, three separate steps. Um, realistically though, we don't, we don't need all of this. We could just do that. And um, this will return the smooth, frequency value. Um, so, I mean, I, I, it's, I have trouble deciding if I should express the idea this way or express it in three lines. And um, I'm curious uh, to hear which is clearer to this audience, because um, I never know if more lines of code is easier or harder in, in a situation like this. I think for me, um, what makes sense, you know, if I just need to process the sample one time and I could just store that in a variable, I don't need a separate process to store the value in a variable. Um, I don't have to call process over and over again, right? Which is the danger, is that someone calls right. it more than once. But I don't, I don't think that's a confusion in the same way that um, generating a sample is not confusing. I like juices, get next value, just name for it, which is essentially what process looks to be doing. It returns a float to the yeah, next yeah. value. Um, well, the, the reason is in a lot, well, a, lot, a lot of these do that and it's it's a little my fear is um something that happened to super collider is that there being eight ways to do one thing kind of makes it hard to know how to do one thing um and, and in some cases i'm trying to not make things flexible that way there's i'm trying not to make like um i think it was the exclamation point that upset me when i was in super collider land but uh i, I can't recall <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to that, avoid. That makes sense. I actually kind of like that. So everything will have a process. It's like, this is what you do at the sample level. Process means sample level shit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, and then regarding to if it was a void function, um, that's fine, but there's no reason I can't return the current value. So I, I, right now I've just decided that you can use it, do it both of these ways. And yeah, but this is actually, I think, you know, if, if you weren't using a, um, optimization, this would be technically faster because you're not creating extra variables that you don't need. Um, so I, I mean, in small scale, it matters, but it doesn't, we don't need those tiny gains if it's a, an educational library. So disregard. Um, okay, so we have our smooth frequency. That we, I don't think we've tested this work yet. Did I? Sign oscillator smooth frequency dot process. Sign oscillator that gets sample. You have to set a smoothing time. Um, no. By default, it's twenty milliseconds. Sign oscillator. Every sample, the oscillator gets a new frequency. Our current sample equals sign oscillator. Curious, and maybe it was working, and I just the 
This is strange. Let's just go ahead and uh I feel like it is smoothing just really fast. Wait, can you hear something? Yes. Yeah, I think it's smoothing. Oh, I can't hear anything at all. Oh, okay, we hear it. We also lost your oh. video, but uh yeah. Oh wow, well, okay. <laughs> well my actually my phone's at seven percent. Keep the video off for the rest unless we need it. I I just plugged my phone in. Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, we I'm glad you it. heard it. I don't know what, what the situation is that I, I'm not hearing it, but is it because I'm, I don't know. Yeah, it worked. Okay, well. It worked. Cool, um, yeah. So given the amount of time we have left, I would like to um, talk a little bit, or I'd like for you to talk a little bit about, okay, so we see all of this, and maybe to some people it seems like, wow, that's, that's a lot, you know, to, to do. What are the advantages for me to do this? Like, why why should I learn to do this? Um, and I think, I mean, I know some of the reasons why I might want to do this, but where does this lead us? And, and then how then do I use Pedal maybe outside of even this environment? Let's say I want to build a VST, right? And Max and Super Collider are not going to do that for me. Um, so this is, this is what does that for me. Um, but maybe not this particular, um, build the application, you know, your application, uh, sure. implementation. Right. So, um, the benefit largely of just learning C++ for audio is the, um, or learning C++ in general is just the amount of code that exists for C++ and, uh, what you can do with it. If you're natively writing in C++, um, that's essentially a like free run to do anything that's you know currently physically possible with a machine. Um, lower level access, I find, and you know, learning C is not a skill that really is super helpful, and I don't think will be as helpful again in, in the future. The lower levels actually end up doing a worse job, even because uh, the, the compilers for C plus um, plus are are getting that faster than the native C. Um, but uh, so C++ opens you to every potential creative idea. Um, and that's another reason I've, the reason I got into build systems is to be able to enact that um, knowledge of C++, you need to be able to build other libraries too. And that's what caused me to go a little deeper into C++ and understanding the build system. Um, for example, when I was doing my PhD, I, was, I started working on uh, GPU audio and I was compiling uh, CUDA and OpenCL, and I would never have been able to try that had I, you know, not gone into the the build system. And I think uh, a lot of this information is kind of locked out, uh, locked into an ivory tower because you need some form of, you know, undergraduate at least, but probably graduate degree in computer science or audio or something to to be even able to start. Uh, so I'm ho hoping Pedal lowers the that barrier. Um, but yeah, so mostly it's, it's useful, I guess, as a skill, uh, just to allow you to do more things. There's a reason. And also, I guess, you know, should not be a motivation, of course, but the jobs that exist are, are in C++. And, uh, there's actually, uh, it's, I, I'm not like, suggesting someone learn C++ for jobs, uh, but there's a reason that they're trying to hire people who know C++. You can do things that you cannot do in other languages. And it's not just these boring, tedious things like making your um, function, you know, 10 nanoseconds faster. Um, but uh, it just allows a broader, a broader set of abilities. Do you, um, I, I'll... sorry to interrupt. Do you know, um, so I often recommend C++ to people. I say something like jump to the, you know, skip, skip to the chase, just go ahead and dive in. Um, but oftentimes I see, you know, people saying that's not really the way of the future exactly. Maybe people should be learning Python. But I personally am not familiar with a lot of um, avenues for doing this sort of audio work in Python. I'm sure it's possible. Is that something you're familiar with? I can't think of any, any reason to do Python for audio yet explicitly. Other than kind of the same thing as C++, Python's getting to a size now that, you know, if you want to do something, use Python, everyone's using it. So only in that sense, but I don't think I've done a bit of Python and I, I kind of hate it for this. Um, and I don't see that getting better. 
And I, I don't think C++ is necessarily going to go anywhere. Um, especially, I don't think it's going to be defeated by Python by any, any means. Um, just because uh, how old it is and how long it's going to last. And um, old here is uh, not saying it's not modern. Like uh, C20 just came out and it, it changed a lot of things that are like really forward thinking. Um, so it, C has the benefit of both being old and modern. And um, Python doesn't have that yet. I guess. Okay, I have a more cerebral question for you. Um, so mm -hmm. this came up several years ago with conversations I had with people, and we talked about works done using music technology. So let's say somebody writes a piece for instrument and electronics and they use Max MSP. Um, in 50 years, you know, will that still be a viable work? And um, here we see something that's written in C++, right? It, it becomes something that's not hidden for one, so we know what everything does, but maybe languages like this are more viable from a, um, what do you call it, from a preservation standpoint. I wonder if you have any thoughts about, I guess one, the preservation aspect, but two, um, is, this, is this a more vi viable creative uh, medium, the language itself? Uh, I'll just leave it there. Mm. I'm going to start with the creative medium. Um, it is more viable with care. <laughs> and there's a lot of different types of care. Um, a phrase I hear often, MA, I heard often in MAT, is it not losing your domain? Um, so you can very easily, you can see plus it's so big, just get lost and forget you came here for audio in the first place. Um, and that happens. Um, and I, you know, I've, I'm personally taking active precautions to make sure that doesn't happen to me. And I, I think that's actually a necessary, a necessary step if you're an artist doing an engineer's job, I guess, is what it sometimes feels like. Um, but it is, it is the most viable medium in my mind because most of our mediums are kind of being built from this. Like if, if you consider open frameworks, everything that came from that, um, that was kind of built on a, on a slice of C++. And um, I say slice in a weird way because you couldn't use every C++ library if you're in open frameworks. You'd still, um, just by using open frameworks, you have to know how to compile that and include it yourself. And so you're still at the mercy of others. And um, if you know how to do that yourself, then your ideas are inhibited by that. And I, I found that just the build system part, which is kind of learning C++, it's one of the languages where learning the build system is part of learning the language. Um, I, I find that although it's a little tedious, it, it really only took me a weekend to get to get running with that. And I didn't have to revisit or learn more knowledge to go back. It's, it's really like CMake has 20 functions that you may use ever, and you just need to learn those, and then you can build whatever you want. So you, you're using these weird tools, but you really don't have to be an expert in, uh, to use them. And that is not your impression when you see them for the first time. If you see it, it oh, I, we have one here. So, you know, this is not friendly looking. This looks pretty terrible, but nothing, you know, it just looks bad, that's all. Um, it, it include the stuff, <laughs> set of property, and they're all just net labeled. But, you know, I got this information somewhere else, like which CPP files do I need to compile MGUI is a Googleable question. So you, you don't need to have all, all the answers or be able to just sleuth things out on your own. Um, so yeah, I think uh, the short answer is as long as um, some care is taken to use C++ right, um, I, I think you can avoid it causing too much extra work that it's not a good tool. I think that's how I would put it. <laughs> I, 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 it's possible to use C++ and it not waste your time. <laughs> All right, I want to turn some questions over to other people. Aaron, I got a question. Um, hey. So for my project, my master's project, and just for my own pursuit, I'm making a pulsar generator synthesizer. Nice. And so I'm doing a lot of stuff at the sample level. And I guess I'm getting to the point where I'm like, I don't know what is going to be grossly inefficient in what isn't. Um, like I, I tried making like five value trees. So I only update them when like a particular category 
because I'm like, maybe that makes a difference and it really doesn't. And I just couldn't get it to work. So I, I don't know how to tell if something's going to be a huge, like is declaring an auto every sample loop. Is that like really bad to do, you know, or um, I most know. Of, yeah, it's hard to find out um, sometimes, especially when you're using a framework large, like just, uh, for example, you message make mentioned making five value trees. Um, it takes knowing Juice's architecture to know that that won't be helpful because all of those value tree messages are happening on the message thread, which is not related to your audio thread and it's not gonna help it or hurt it. And unless you're doing something very wrong, like um, allocating a lot of memory on that message thread, um, it's not going to have any problems either. Uh, for the, we're using value tree for the DAW I'm working on and uh, I just made an interface to um, if we're so unconcerned about that message thread that we just send whatever we want. We actually built an interface to an interface um, and we weren't worried about the extra cost on the message thread. But in general, to find out if something is good or bad, uh, the, the quick way to find out is to compile it to assembly language. When you compile C++, it goes to assembly language usually first and then to ones and zeros. And you don't need to know assembly language. You just need to look at the number of lines and uh, compare it to another way, look at the number of lines of assembly. And that's a really good approximation for how fast or how slow things will be. Um, but I can, yeah, the, um, how to compile something to assemble quickly is another story, but yeah. Uh, but uh, the, most, the most important thing and what I see the, um, some of the best programmers I've watched work uh, do is they don't care about this stuff at all. Um, they are not asking those questions. Like, is this the most efficient way to do that? And um, I, I never see them ask that question. And in the classroom, Carl Yerke is one of my professors. Um, he, uh, he, if you talked about performance or optimization, he would immediately change the subject because it's such a common trait for computer programmers to be focused. And we want to write really optimized code. But the fact is that co the compiler is going to do a better job writing our code than we are. And even if we try to do things faster, um, if you run, build it in runtime mode, your change is probably going to be overruled by the compiler anyway. So if you're making trivial mistakes that'll make a huge difference, your compiler is going to fix those for you. Um, your compiler is allowed to enter code any amount it wants to, as long as the result that, of the, uh, as long as the rules of C++ are allowed. And that can actually mean that's surprising a bit, because it actually does things ahead of time. It will do predictions about what's going to happen and start you know, creating ones and zeros. So um, I guess the bigger point is just not to worry about trivial things. Like, is it faster to use auto or ints here? Um, it, it, it won't ever be faster. Um, it's going to change the type when it compiles anyway, or when it runs. So in that case, that, that will never change. But the bigger, the bigger story is don't, don't concern yourselves with it until the error is actually making your application bad. And the, the small things you can do to actually make a difference on performance, you'll learn along the way. And they're not really worth kind of pursuing independently. Although I, I fall into that trap still, I'll still try to, you know, over optimize things that are kind of just refs. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you're, if, yeah, um, it would take specific examples, but if you want to show me your, the code base at some point, I can point out things that might be, might slow it down. Or if it's so slow that it doesn't work, I'm happy to help try to identify why yeah it's working now but i'd love to have you look at it and just see it's always cool to see how other people would do things completely differently sometimes and yeah send me a message and we can set up a time yeah. happy to look at more code <laughs> well um it's been a great talk um i wanted to conclude it by reading this always interesting quote from the computer music tutorial 1996 um curtis rhodes who says Knowing how to program is the key to doing something really new in computer music. Thus, a familiarity with programming concepts is an essential topic for the student. Uh, so there it is. In case you were wondering whether you should <laughs> learn how to program or not, you probably should. <laughs> Curtis says so. <laughs> oh, uh, speaking of Curtis, he just uh, sent out a request for people to edit his figures one last time on his book. So okay. he, he, he did submit his book. It's going to happen. There's going to be a second edition. Great. <laughs> it's been a while. Wow, we're almost, what is it? We're 1996, we're, I think, right? So we're 20, 25 years since, <laughs> since the book came. It's about time for, for a new one. <laughs> Amazing. Well, with that, I'm going to stop the recording. So goodbye, public. <laughs>